on the news. Honoring a civil rights icon on what would have been his 94th birthday. The Diocese of Brooklyn commemorates Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in order to achieve a better tomorrow. It requires for us to really take our discipleship, our faith, seriously. Then doing more than remembering, teaching how Catholic academies are educating the next generation about social justice. Plus this. An amazing rescue scene in California. Crews worked fast to save a driver before his car goes over a cliff. And the key to staying young, yoga. At least that's the story one 100-year-old enthusiast tells us. I'm Christine Fursichetti. Current News starts right now. Remembering a giant, the legacy that lives on and the lessons left behind. Martin Luther King Jr., a civil rights icon. He preached a message of nonviolent resistance. The doctor organized hundreds of protests, marches, and speeches, helping to bring about landmark legislation and change the course of this country. Today, Current News' Jessica Easthope tells us the Diocese of Brooklyn isn't just remembering, they are planning a dream of their own. Hi, Jess. Hi, Christine. Yeah, today, more than 100 people came to St. Kevin's in Flushing to discuss racism in the church and keeping the spirit of Dr. King alive. Live. There was a panel discussion with input from the audience as well, but the biggest takeaway from today was this isn't enough, that in order to truly atone for America's original sin of racism, we have to start with ourselves. A prayer service in honor of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who before he was a civil rights leader and activist, he was a preacher. Every thousand mile journey begins with the first step. He prayed, sang, and listened to the experiences and hopes of black Catholics in the Diocese of Brooklyn. I feel that we are not uh, seen as a prize in this diocese. Concerns like this were addressed during a group discussion. Panelists Deacon Kevin McCormick, superintendent of diocese schools, and Father Johnny Gibson from the Archdiocese of New Orleans, one of the youngest African-American priests in the country, posed five questions on how the church is doing to address and oust racism. Christ invites each and every one of us to see our brothers and sisters as ourselves, to care for those on the margins, those, and even more so those who are close to us. What do I need to do to change? What do I need to, to look at and see where systemic hatred, where systemic injustice is, and begin to think, how can I challenge it within myself, and then begin to challenge it in the larger system? Bishop Robert Brennan sat in on the discussion of how the institution of the church is perceived by black Catholics in the diocese. I think that's really the central thing, that we can listen deeply to one another, that we can learn from each other's experience, and be inspired by each other's hopes. The discussion and prayer service, which was organized by the Vicariate for Black Catholic Concerns, was viewed as only the beginning of what's to come. It's so important that these stories be heard and that others feel our pain of some of the experiences and not positive experiences that many black and brown people have had in the church. This is the first year the Diocese of Brooklyn has held a panel discussion like this on Martin Luther King Day. And Christine, the overwhelming consensus was that this needs to happen more often. Mm -hmm. And Father Alonzo Cox, the vicar for the Vicariate of Black Catholic Concerns in the Diocese, says that maybe this will even become a Martin Luther King Day tradition and will happen not just on the holiday, but more throughout the year. That would be nice. Jess, what were some of the suggestions made today when it comes to how the church and specifically the Diocese of Brooklyn can do better? Yeah, Christine, you know, like I mentioned, Bishop Brennan was there today listening intently to everything both the panel and parishioners were saying, taking notes, but mm -hmm. there were some people that were upset that more diocesan leadership wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And I think for them and for people who have experienced racism within the church, that these panel discussions, a lot of healing can happen at them and that it's a good first step. And I know it's hard to kind of get things in motion after discussions like this, but was there anything concrete that people can look out for now? 
Yeah, it's definitely a challenge, but I think what came out of this also was representation matters. Mm -hmm. People want more outreach to young black Catholics because if there is more diversity within vocations to the religious life or to the priesthood, black Catholics will want to be more involved and mm -hmm. see themselves within the church and truly believe and feel like they belong to the church and within the church. All right, Jess, we'll be sure to follow up on these initiatives. Thanks so much. Speaking of change, the Diocese of Brooklyn has already implemented some changes from previous listening sessions on racism. Since then, Catholic academies have been honoring Dr. King's legacy by passing it on to the next generation. So we create a loving, open environment where they don't need to be afraid of these issues. Coming up on Currents News, we take a closer look at the social justice curriculum currently in place in Catholic schools throughout Brooklyn and Queens, giving kids a lesson on race and equality through faith. That's coming up on Currents News. Bishops across the U.S. are echoing the discussions happening today in the Diocese of Brooklyn. They believe the country needs to go beyond remembering and quoting King and instead address racial disparities, access to affordable housing and economic opportunities. In a statement, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops said this. Today, when Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. would have celebrated his 94th birthday, we reflect on his legacy of a nonviolent struggle against racial injustice. In the 60 years since Dr. King's I Have a Dream speech, we recognize the progress made towards a just society that leaves no one on the margins without failing to acknowledge that much work remains. And making history to mark history, Joe Biden is now the first sitting president to ever speak at a Sunday service at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta. He followed the path of Moses. That's where Martin Luther King Jr. was a co-pastor. The president told the congregation the past actions of the civil rights icon were a guide to the nation's future. Are we the people who are going to choose love over hate? I believe Dr. King's life and legacy show us the way we should pay attention. I really do. He had every reason to believe, as others of the generation did, that history had already been written that the division would be America's destiny. But he rejected that outcome. Biden said he has spoken before Parliament, kings, queens, and leaders all over the world, but said this was most intimidating. The president was invited to the Georgia church by its current senior pastor, Reverend Raphael Warnock, who just recently won re-election to the U.S. Senate. Yet another set of classified documents connected to President Biden have been found, which is why the Justice Department is appointing former U.S. Attorney Robert Hur to look into the matter. Hur is a Trump appointee and will determine if the president mishandled the classified materials. Attorney General Merrick Garland said that Hur is the perfect person for the job because of his long and distinguished career as a prosecutor. Hur not only said the investigation would move, quote, swiftly and thoroughly, but also so fair, impartial, and dispassionate judgment. The investigation is ongoing, but here's the latest on what was found. At least 20 documents from two separate locations, one set from Biden's private home, the other at his former think tank office in D.C. In terms of content, there were U.S. intelligence memos, briefing materials related to Iran, Ukraine, and the United Kingdom, as well as top secret files. All of the documents and contents were turned over to the National Archive, according to the White House. But that's not enough for the GOP. Congressman James Comer, who is the chairman of the House Oversight and Accountability Committee, says that there are a lot of concerns that need to be addressed. He wants to see all the documents, conversations between the members of Biden's team, and view a visitor's log of the president's home, which the White House Counsel's Office says doesn't exist. He said this will help figure out who had access to classified materials and how they got there in the first place. New York City's mayor got a first-hand look at the migrant crisis in Texas over the weekend, and now Eric Adams is sending yet another repeat message to the feds. He says the lack of coordination on the national level is turning the American dream into a nightmare. No city deserves what is happening. Mayor Eric Adams demanding the federal government do more to respond to the growing migrant crisis. Our cities are being undermined. And we don't deserve this. Migrants don't deserve this. 
and the people who live in the cities don't deserve this. He visited the southern border over the weekend to see firsthand where the crisis begins, speaking with Border Patrol officers in El Paso, Texas. But Adam says the asylum seekers who cross into the U.S. here end up on the streets of New York City and other major cities across the country. And according to him, the city is at its breaking point, caring for more than 26,000 migrants right now. He says some 3,100 arrived in the last week and more than 800 in just one day, which is a record for New York. Adam says it could end up costing the Big Apple $2 billion. It's not just a bed to sleep, it's food, it's health care, it's education, it's services, much needed services. The mayor says he found out migrants are being promised things before they cross the border that just aren't available, like jobs and shelter in New York City hotels. We've always been a city where the Statue of Liberty sits in our harbor, where we know what it is to come here and try to pursue the American dream. And that dream should not turn into a nightmare because of the lack of coordination that we're seeing on a national level. The migrant issue is bound to come up this week when Mayor Adams attends the American Conference of Mayors meeting in Washington, D.C. There's a lot more news headed your way. How the Diocese of Brooklyn is going above and beyond to teach children some of Dr. Martin Luther King's lessons. Then demanding answers. Lawmakers want to know how a computer glitch forced the FAA to ground planes and what you can do to protect your travel plans when flying. And a scene out of a Hollywood movie. Rescue crews worked tirelessly to rescue a driver before his car goes over a cliff. On this Martin Luther King Day, we are honoring the life and legacy of the civil rights icon. But Catholic academies in the Diocese of Brooklyn are doing more than just remembering the man who spoke about freedom and social justice. They're passing on his lessons to the next generation. For the past two years, the academies have taught race, tolerance and equality through a special social justice curriculum. Here's Jessica Easthope once again to tell us about it. We need to treat everybody just equally the same. Learning about social justice isn't new in the diverse classrooms at Our Lady of Perpetual Health Catholic Academy. No, no. But for the first time, it's an official part of the curriculum. Give them a much better, broader perspective of life, of God, you know, and, and what God expects from us. What do you see? Bishop Nicholas DiMarzio announced every school in the Diocese of Brooklyn would make the new social justice curriculum part of religion class. Each month, students will explore a new theme. September is solidarity. Teachers say it's an opportunity to address current events and issues of race and equality through faith. We're taking a step away from textbooks and kind of teaching the children to take a page from Jesus and to um, be as he did. The goal is for students and teachers to embrace social justice as part of a Catholic education. So we create a loving, open environment where they don't need to be afraid of these issues. Every month, teachers across the diocese will be provided with new age-appropriate course materials and book suggestions. In Sunset Park, Jessica Easthope, Currents News. That's not the only change to lesson plans around the diocese. Brooklyn's Jesuit prep in East Flatbush recently added black Catholic history to its curriculum. The school's president, Father Mario Powell, believes the best way to help the majority minority students shape the future is by teaching them more about the past. It is a story of oppression and racism, but it's also a story of, of triumph. It's a story of evangelization. And I think Catholics, both black and white and brown and everything in between, should learn this history. When we become ignorant of it, we allow others to weaponize our ignorance. And uh, that is simply, uh, it's, not be it's beyond not being good. It's something that we can't afford in this day and age. He points out that history also reveals role models like Father Augustus Tolton. The former slave was ordained as America's first black Catholic priest in 1886, and he is now on the path to sainthood. Now imagine this, you're on a plane about to take off, traveling 115 miles per hour when suddenly 
The pilot needs to hit the brakes because another plane is crossing the runway. Talk about a close call. Well, that's exactly what happened at JFK after two fully loaded passenger planes narrowly avoided a T-bone collision. The National Transportation Safety Board is now launching an investigation into the incident. It all happened Friday night when an air traffic controller frantically tried to stop the takeoff of a Boeing 737 operated by Delta Airlines merely 1,000 feet ahead, crossing the runway in front of it without permission was a Boeing 777 operated by American Airlines. JFK was recently voted by the Bureau of Transportation Statistics as one of the worst airports for travel in the United States. The incident comes after last week's FAA meltdown, where a computer glitch forced hundreds of cancellations and thousands of delays of flights around the country. Now lawmakers are demanding answers. And as Karen Kafer reports, passengers are asking the question, can I trust my airline itinerary? Dozens of lawmakers on both sides of the aisle demanding more answers in a letter to Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg on Friday concerned the FAA technology issues that led to the disruption of thousands of U.S. flights last week could run deeper. We've been able to make some major gains in terms of accountability for airlines uh, when it comes to their customer service. We equally have to make sure that FAA has the systems, the staffing, uh, and the operations that it needs. The FAA meltdown on the heels of the Southwest Airlines holiday debacle that canceled thousands of flights. Despite the recent headlines, Katie Nastro, travel expert for Going, says the majority of flights are getting from point A to point B on time. The passengers can prepare to be their own troubleshooters. Sometimes things happen, you know, having that flexibility and just being prepared with a backup plan is never a bad idea. That begins with reading the fine print on a ticket. There are controllable disruptions. That's things within the airline's control that they can manage, like a staffing issue, like a software issue internally. And then there are uncontrollables like the weather and air traffic control, which is an entirely other separate entity from airlines. That distinction will determine your compensation from an airline. Nastro also recommends nonstop flights to reduce the chance of disruption and early morning flights to avoid the domino effect of disruptions to a flight schedule like the FAA stop last week. In Washington, Karen Kafa, Currents News. Now to California, the state's still enduring storm after storm. There's mud and debris for miles. Entire communities have been forced to evacuate, and some rural regions are entirely cut off from the outside world. Plus, another round of rain is about to roll in. At least 19 people have been killed, but the good news is even more have been rescued. At a mobile home park, rescue crews evacuated 175 people this weekend. The water growing waist deep for some residents as half the park flooded in the latest storm. South San Joaquin County Fire Authority said their crews actually had to use hoses to move more water away from the homes to help mitigate the flooding. A temporary shelter was set up nearby. In another community, a zip line has become a lifeline. Daryl Hardy set up this line to the main road New Year's weekend, completely unaware that it would soon help more than a half a dozen households who had become stranded due to the flooding. The bridge they normally used was damaged and can't be repaired until water levels go down. So for now, Daryl and his wife Stacy have been using the zip line, getting medicine, food and fuel to their neighbors. This next story embodies the saying, count your blessings. Like a scene out of a movie, firefighters in San Diego rescue a driver as his car was dangling off the side of a cliff. Madison Wheel has more. An Escalade precariously dangling over the cliff's edge. Firefighters say the driver was parked on Coast Boulevard up above when for unknown reasons, the car suddenly went over the edge. Sherlock, the car landed where it was. Um, it could have been worse. Car could have gone over the side and then it would have been a whole different outcome. The rescue team up against heavy rains and high surf, using ropes first to secure the Escalade, then using a massive crane and pulley system to airlift the driver out. Go ahead and swing the lift. Pretty much flew the patient from the ledge down there up to Coast Boulevard where we uh, package the patient up and he's in route to the hospital. Very crazy scene. Um, these, the rescue team did awesome out here trying to, you know, make everyone like 
level-headed, not people worrying and, you know, crying. A crowd gathering in the rain, witnessing the dramatic rescue unfold. They had, like, ropes getting down there, and there was a spotlight. Just double-checking that the person, like, the car is not going anywhere because the, fr the front two tires were off the edge of the rocks. We're told the driver is in stable condition, miraculously with minor injuries only. Go slow on the roads and, you know, be blessed by God. How scary is that? An amazing story from Madison Wheel there. It took about 90 minutes for crews to rescue the driver, and the three dozen or so first responders did an amazing job. Still to come on Current News, the inspirational words people said about Cardinal George Pell after traveling from all around the world for their last goodbyes. And taking the term sweat into the oldies very seriously, the 100-year-old man that does yoga to stay young. Catholics from all over the world traveled to the Vatican Saturday to say their final goodbye to Cardinal George Pell. St. Peter's Basilica was actually overflowing for the funeral mass. Extra chairs were added at the last minute to accommodate people standing in the back. The liturgy was presided over by Cardinal Giovanni Battista Ray, the dean of the College of Cardinals. At the end, Pope Francis presided over the rite of final commendation, which is custom for any cardinal's funeral. Among those in the crowd at Pell's funeral, besides his brother and cousin, were Vatican diplomats, other cardinals, bishops, and priests from Rome and beyond. He was very bold and very like um, convicting. He says, uh, "Whatever you do, uh, please don't join the order, uh, the OPD, which is the Order of Perpetual Discernment." And he he was he was very encouraging that we we just need to make a decision. I remember him organising these uh, dinners for men discerning the priesthood, and I got invited to one of those. And I thought it was just a dinner with the Archbishop of Sydney at the time. Uh, it turned out to be a vocations dinner. <laughs> It caught a lot of us by surprise, but that was sort of like maybe the bit of the forthright nature that he was. Cardinal Pell passed away last week from a cardiac arrest following hip surgery. He was 81 years old. Following the funeral, Cardinal Pell's body will be returned to Australia. He will be buried in the crypt of St. Mary's Cathedral in Sydney. Now we have a secret to share, some wisdom from a centenarian. Don Burns says the secret to staying independent is staying flexible. And he doesn't mean in your beliefs. He's been a yogi for years. Karen Kornacki has the story. Don Burns just turned 100, and he credits yoga for keeping him flexible and mobile. Well, it just gets you to moving all parts of your body. Don started taking classes 16 years ago and it's helped him in several ways. Balance, strength, his mobility, getting up and down off the floor. So you want to have the strength to get back up off the floor, to get up and down and be independent. Don's independent and his 96 year old brother came to visit him this week with his family. They were impressed. He was starting to slow down and then all of a sudden he started yoga, I guess, 15 years ago, and then he started getting up and moving. He's very limber, and he uh, I, I'm just surprised that he he's not in assisted living, and he's taking care of himself. Don comes to class twice a week, wearing his jeans, suspenders, and dress shirt, enjoying the benefits he gets from yoga. There's just a variety of different body positions that you go through in there and they're getting up and getting down. In fact, Don's made it clear it's one of the secrets to living a long and healthy life. You say, Don, how did you live to be a hundred? He said, well, I walk a mile a day. I do yoga, especially shoulder stand. And he said, and then I love God and love my family and just keep moving forward. I'm impressed that he does yoga in his jeans. That was Karen Gernacki reporting. Burns says he feels better now than he did 15 years ago. Good for him. And that is Currents News. I'm Christine Persichetti. Thank you for joining us because we are putting your faith in the news. Hope to see you again next time.